Hello, all you mental monsters and scare tactic scientists. I can see that a good walk in the woods with a camera on a character whose head is full of worries just isn't going to cut it for you. You need something a little bit more inventive, odd, puzzling, and perplexing. And that's quite alright. Innovation keeps things fresh, and nowhere is there more value placed on innovation than the Red Path. Walking around in this field is an act of using the format as your content instead of just using it to display content. On YouTube, creators present video records of a storyline that audiences watch much in the same way they take in videos from any other channel. Usually, YouTube as a site is just the platform. It's the plate that we place a meal on we've cooked so people can eat it. On the red path, you're handing somebody an ice cream cone, or if you prefer, a taco. The container or serving device is entirely part of the product. You eat all of it, it's all food and was intended to be. The delivery method is part of the art and can sometimes be the majority of the statement that you're making. And over here, that's a major part of what we're all about, saying something. Instead of a viewer or participant understanding what the art says by watching from a distance as they would with a movie or a TV show, you're making them a direct recipient of the artistic message by involving them, like we sometimes get from a video game. The grand reveal in the first Bioshock game is a great example of this, but I think the best modern example would be Undertale. Your actions as the player character are entirely part of the message, and the way you feel about what you've done and the impact that you have on the world is the point. Participation is a huge part of Red Path artwork. On the Blue Path, we experience stories that tell us about other people and see how we relate to them. On the Red Path, it's much more about how we see ourselves and what can be done directly to us as audience members. Red Path gets a lot more personal than Blue just through the approach that we use and the content forms chosen. That's the possibility you have as part of this area. You can really get into somebody's head by engaging them. Or you can just play around with format in a new way that mystifies an audience. I'll admit that when it comes to content I've covered on Nightmind, I've had more of a focus on blue material and the less complicated or multifaceted aspects of Red Path than, say, fully in-depth alternate reality game experiences. As much as I absolutely love the original Cloverfield ARG, for instance, I haven't stopped to visit those woods much. There are a lot of trees you've got to stop at, and those trees have a whole lot of leaves. Things like I Love Bees, the Nine Inch Nails, Year Zero ARG, they have a lot of pieces that would take way more than one video for me to tackle, so I just haven't been able to visit them yet. But if that's what you're after, I understand entirely, and I'm happy to share that I'm well versed in that language too. Storytelling of that nature is much less about art and more about gameplay and intrigue, but what they lack in deep, introspective moments and statements about life, they do make up for in excitement. I would actually consider the secret plot to the Five Nights at Freddy's series part of that territory, for all the extra work that Scott Cawthon does outside of the game releases to keep that mystery in play. No matter what your aim is when it comes to how much heart or how much brain you want to put into your Red Path experience, the lessons of this territory remain the same, as well as many of the principles. You'll be using the resources at your disposal made available through the internet and technology to engage audience members on a much more direct, psychological level, building electronic mazes and traps that would make any Batman villain proud. I don't play any tabletop games myself, but from what I know of Dungeon Masters or Game Masters, if it's something that you're into, you'll have a pretty good shot at this field. I have only two warnings for you when it comes to choosing Red Path. If your cravings as a creator to be seen on a wide scale are quite strong, you might feel a little bit down sometimes. Your audience will most likely be way more into the game that they're playing or characters they're engaging with than the brilliance of what you've built, and based on what platforms you include in the experience, you might not even get that much natural exposure. Seeing how people playing into your experience feel about it on places like the Unfiction Forum or subreddit will be a major thrill and a lot of fun but they might be the only places you get that kind of high. The other issue you may have is much more difficult. I guarantee at least half of you who are aiming for more of a Wyoming incident project than Poppy experience are going to deal with this. The complication of building your game and the complexities of it will get to you, and you might find that you're coming short on resources for what you want to execute, or even worse, what you actually need to make happen according to your plans. This is what stops a lot of people dead in their tracks and what kills many games. Hitting rough spots in the process where you don't know how to carry on the next part of the experience, or you just don't have the knowledge to pull off an idea. We're going to try our best on the Red Path course to troubleshoot these issues, but I won't always be available to provide direct advice in these videos. You'll need to do the best you can to fight through it. Thankfully, I've got an official subreddit that should come very much in handy to all of you for working out issues you may have and seeking advice from the community. I'll even be dropping in whenever I'm able to help out. With all of that addressed, let's get to outlining our field of play for Red Path territory. From the craziest of web series to the most expansive alternate reality games, there is a hardcore, steadfast principle that can be found in operation. The Aura of Reality. 
Our field is very different from most entertainment in that when we play pretend, we go all in. We usually do not advertise our projects as works of fiction or entertainment, even if it's obvious that's what we're doing. We're not making movies, or TV shows, or games. We are making immersive, engaging stories that have a full sense of the platform they're being shown on and the audience who is watching. Watch a Netflix original and you're seeing a story about characters who have no idea they're being watched in a world that is completely ignorant to us, and taking place in a world that has absolutely no influence on it from being hosted on a streaming website. Watch a YouTube series and you're seeing characters who, in most cases, are completely aware of you and the website that they're uploading to. They know they're uploading to YouTube. The audience and the platform are part of the fiction, and by extension, the internet as a whole is the fictional world in which this all takes place. Therefore, we can't exactly advertise the experience if we want to keep that very powerful immersive effect. We're all attending a Halloween masquerade. Your costume is your character, and we all know we're playing pretend. But while we're here, we do not break character. Some of us play monsters, some of us are victims, a few are heroes and guides, and the rest of us? We're the witnesses to events, unwilling participants to shocking plots, and the playthings of a paranormal force. Audience members are part of the cast. Have you ever been to Universal Studios and taken part in a ride or attraction led by a park employee playing a role, acting as if they were in the fictional world built around them? Do you remember being treated as if you were legitimately part of the event going on? That idea is the entire conceit of our field. We're the Universal Studios of the internet. Whether Blue Path, Red Path, or Yellow Path, that is the mindset you need to keep. We don't have the means to produce something in the traditional television or movie areas, and it's not as fun to do anyway. So we need to keep our make-believe atmosphere intact as much as we can. And if doing so means keeping in mind that your audience, your platform, your delivery methods, and the characters involved with all of that are part of the story, you come to realize just how much intelligent writing you need to do to pull off this trick. Writing is where any online storytelling project or alternate reality game lives or dies. If you can't justify it in writing, you've got a hollow piece that can be broken in a single line of criticism and leaves the project weaker. When you're at a role-playing masquerade, if somebody asks you about part of your costume and you can't justify having it with a solid answer, you are going to break the atmosphere. It's cool, right? It's not a valid response for your reasoning behind the actions that you take. You are not allowed to walk into this masquerade with a trinket on your costume and just have a backstory of, Oh, I thought it looked cool. <laughs> Why and how are the two most important questions for writing in this art form? Sometimes you don't exactly need to know how, but you must always, always be able to convince me with your reasons why. You need to know why a character chose to do a certain thing or say something. You need to know why they recorded anything they shot on camera or on a microphone. You need to be able to convince me with the reasons why they're uploading and why they chose a specific platform or format. Every choice you make for the execution of your project must be backed up by writing. If you cannot tell me why a character chose to do something, or use a certain website, or make a certain document, it's a weak point. And if your project is more alternate reality game than web series, you definitely need to back up everything in your writing, especially one particular thing people always ask me about that very few people ever seem to get right. We'll be visiting that one later, trust me. But remember this, your ARG is like a Jenga tower. Have one bad brick in place, and a little bit of nudging will knock the whole thing down. Writing also matters extensively on the red path when what you're doing is an abstract piece. In Alan tutorial, we could often infer the reasons why things occurred without even having it explained to us directly, and we understood the character's motivations for every action taken, including the use of YouTube and Twitter. Taking the internet forum for criticism in society of human behavior is prevalent in that poppy and info channel. And although both of those channels often come across as even weirder and harder to interpret than Alan Tutorial was, having the proper informed setup that can be discerned means viewers can and will discover the meaning of the art that was intended. Symbols must have meaning, and reasons why they were chosen that connect to the idea. Colors and images must reflect the concept and make sense for their placement alongside events and characters. Even the font that you might use if text is needed has to be on the mark with your idea. Whether your reasoning is completely logical from the standpoint of a game and storytelling perspective, or entirely meant to serve concept and audience impression, you need to have a solid answer to why you made the choices you did in any circumstance. The answer must be convincing. It must be in line with what we know about a character concerns or the purpose of a platform you chose to use. It needs to make sense with your other answers and reasoning, and it can't contradict anything you've already set up. You need to explain why something occurred and how it fits as well as Batman informing Commissioner Gordon how a villain's plot was formed and how he unraveled it. Or, if you prefer, you need to be Velma at the end of every episode of Scooby-Doo when they unmask the villain and tell the cops what the deal was. 
Basically, if you can start talking about the reasons you did something to me and hear the grand revelation music from the Saw movies playing in your head, you're covered. But how do we get to that point where it all makes sense and fits? How do we do that with online storytelling? Let's take a look. I think one of the best examples I can give for any Red Path person is This House Has People In It by Wham City Comedy. Abstract art approach? Boom, you've got it. Alternate reality game immersion? Yeah, you've definitely got it. This house incorporated a website for a false company, a fake database backend, and tons of files composed of videos, images, audio, and even a game to make artistic statements while immersing viewers completely. Reasons and writing can be found all over this project. The idea of surveillance, privacy invasion, and coming to conclusions about people based on outsider evidence is a big portion of the art we get. There's your abstract portion. We come across this through our actions as a viewer and participant, digging into a database for a company we don't belong to and spying on a family that we don't know. We look at the videos taken from inside their home, the collected evidence of pictures and audio files, and we use it all to judge them and come to conclusions. And you know, we could have had that just as easily through one whole YouTube channel upload of the videos found on the site, or the first video that aired on Adult Swim itself. But instead, we had game elements, immersion pathways to go down to become a real part of the experience. We looked up the AB Video Solutions website, we broke in, figured out how to work the database, and dug into all of the collected information. By way of our actions and the impressions that we got from what we saw, we embody so much of what's being said in the work. We become the snooping, insidious company inside the family's home. Creating barriers to access for the material and spreading it all out in pieces allowed Wham City to make a game that says a lot about us, a lot about people, and a lot about companies and organizations. This House Has People In It is a great example of a project about people breaking in. Meanwhile, Info Channel is a perfect statement about somebody reaching out. An absolutely crazy television network that wants as many viewers as possible, believing they're the ultimate entertainment replacement. Info Channel uses a very open website, Twitter, YouTube channel, Roku streaming channel, Amazon video availability, and now, even Twitch live streaming to get as many eyes on them as possible. And what happens when you engage with Info Channel? You get blasted with a load of nonsensical, overhyped garbage, an obvious parody of television and mainstream media. The ways Info Channel is available and how it tries to engage you are its immersive pieces, and those are, in themselves, an artistic statement, while the content hits you with the abstract art in full. And finally, we have our middle ground, Knock 10. The artificial intelligence in the series is reaching out to us, but we also have to reach out to engage it. Knock 10 is a case of give and take. Once provided with awareness of this cryptic piece, it's up to us as the audience to decipher the coded messages and figure out who's sending them and why. The platform, YouTube, is the most open access point for Knock 10 to get help from its place in the Mariana's Trench. The coded messages are a way of disguising dangerous information that will only be revealed for those who are dedicated enough to solve them. It's also quite possible that Knock 10 believes it's catching the eyes of a specific person who has been trained to decode its messages, but ends up adapting to a full audience once engagement occurs. Knock 10 is more blue path with red path elements, being that it's more so telling a story through coded means than delivering abstract art, but it can show you how to do that while having smart writing behind the choices made. Now, if it's more of the abstract side of red path you want, then abstractions is definitely what you're after. This series uses the video medium to convey thoughts, feelings, and ideas through symbols, visuals, and audio. There may be a story developing in here, but its main objective is to produce emotion in you and get its audience thinking by speaking in a more artistic language. When it comes to making stuff like this, you can bet that a heavy amount of thinking and reasoning went into every video. There would be a long, well-expressed answer for whenever you ask the author, why? As for why it ended up on YouTube, its creator or central character appears to be seeking emotional and mental understanding. They seek a connection, a dialogue through unconventional language. None of these projects go about their execution based on the idea of how to be seen. They instead make choices based on what serves the concept or the message of the project. Every decision must make sense for the story and the story's artistic intention. If the reason why a choice was made is, in fact, to be seen, then it had better be the character responsible for that action who needed to be seen, not you. It's the Knock 10 and Abstractions cases. The character who is uploading needs to have a very valid reason for where and how they upload, how often, and what kind of media they upload, and they need a damn good reason to even be uploading in the first place. Otherwise, you're thinking with your desires, not your projects. There are very few cases in which you can get away without thinking about this. Most of the time, you cannot. Now that we've established our foundation of writing values and viewed a few examples in action, let's talk about how to carry out our own plans for Red Path projects. Your field of play is as wide as the internet itself. Any website where you can upload something, engage with an audience, or have an audience engage with you or something you've made is at your disposal. 
Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr are social networks where you can bring characters or groups to life with an active speaking presence. You're also able to choose what you'd like to use based on the style each site brings to the table and their capabilities. Facebook is very official and extremely interactive, highly personal stuff that can reach a lot of people, but Facebook's user base isn't used to our kind of work. Twitter is more of a mass approach, mass viewing platform that can get personal, but your ability to upload and customize is limited. Tumblr is almost like having a personal website. It's only as connected to the rest of Tumblr as you make it, but it is extremely open to customization, blogging, content uploading aside from long videos, and receiving personal correspondence you can make public or keep in your inbox. If you have a story with a fictional company or a group, it is far more likely to use Facebook and Twitter to come across as believable, while characters can use any of the major social networks. If a character or group presence is needed online in a social way, these are your best outlets. If a specialized site is necessary for a character or group, you may find websites like DeviantArt or Medium to be helpful. DeviantArt will only truly work for characters who produce things that would go on there, of course, but Medium is a good site for anybody who would release long written pieces, whether they're a professional entity or a person. YouTube is the most obvious place of all for video and anybody can have a presence here if needed, from groups to single characters. You could also try Vimeo or Vidme, but I think you would really need a good writing reason or practical influence to choose any secondary platforms. There's Bandcamp and SoundCloud for audio if you're an audio-heavy project or need a platform to release pure audio work, and if you're skilled in game development, you've got Itch.io and Game Jolt. For file sharing, there's Dropbox, Mediafire, and a whole bunch of other sites that let you upload and download for free. You can fill an account with whatever you need to share and then copy the links to whatever other sites you're using as an audience engagement platform. And that is really just the very lightest amount of useful sites I can mention. This is the internet. Some clever thinking and a link posted in the right place is all you'll need to craft your storytelling web. The most difficult hurdle you may have to jump for your concept might be the issue of figuring out how to adapt it to the internet. You have this idea, and it's really cool, but why would the characters involved need to be online? Why or how would these events end up on a website in some form, or documented electronically in a way that can be shared? Like we've already established, the entire foundation of our field consists of keeping the reality atmosphere intact, and that requires there being a solid reason for why things end up online. You've got to have both. We need believable reasons for the story to end up on the internet in some way, it needs to make sense for the characters involved to have put it there in the places it showed up, and it cannot break the Halloween masquerade atmosphere. For some ideas, this is no issue at all. Many of you who are plotting more game than series already know where and how you want to take things online, but for others, we've got some problem solving to do. So now it's the moment you've all been waiting for. Or just maybe five of you who actually expected it, I don't know. Professor Nocturne is going to sit down and make up a web series project with you right here, right now. We're gonna fake a web series. Let's see how we can adapt an idea to the internet while playing inside the guidelines that we've set up. We're going to start where most people who attempt a Red Path concept go. I can't even count how many times I've been approached in character for somebody's new series that's trying a monster or mystery reaches out to you sort of deal. People seem to really love this one, and I do understand why, but I seldom see it done well enough to take the bait. Here's what usually happens. A creator will put together a channel that makes a big show of being made by some all-knowing, super secret, or creepy and mysterious character. Sometimes they're from an organization, sometimes they're on their own. Either way, they're pulling out all the little mystery hints and come hither motions in the flavor of Tiliar from Marble Hornets, The Observer and Tribe 12, and a little bit of habit from Everyman Hybrid. And those who don't lean in that direction take on the appearance of Morpheus from The Matrix. And yeah, that's silly, you say. You totally agree. Except there's a part of you way in the back of your mind that's kind of hurt now because you were kind of planning on doing that. Just a little bit. You had it all mapped out, too. It was going to be internet-based communication with an alien that made contact with humans. Probably would have had a lure set out with a couple of videos containing secret codes and such. You had been excited about this idea, but now you're not so sure. Well, don't give up yet, alien fan. We're going to address your concept and see how to take it from A. Lameo to Area 51. We've talked about the need to serve your project by only doing what makes sense for its characters, right? And we've also talked about the need of a platform to fit for the motivations of the uploading character. You might already have answers for me if I challenge you on why your approach for this alien character works. Because YouTube is where the most people are, you say, and the alien wants to meet people. Okay, cool. The alien wants to meet people, right. And YouTube does have a lot of people. Does the alien want to meet people for nice reasons or horrifying reasons? Horrifying reasons, you tell me. What is this, a Nickelodeon show? I'm not making any nice aliens. Okay, okay, also cool. You know I can always support malicious intent. So, tell me, why is the alien using secret codes? And why on YouTube? Because secret codes lure people in and the codes would just be ignored on social media, you say, imaginary student. 
Ah, alright. The alien is trying to lure people in. With its secret codes. And you're using YouTube because social media would ignore them, huh? Why is that? Because they just see a bunch of weird text and maybe images and then scroll past it. But with a video, they sit and watch. Yes, you are correct. With a video, they sit and watch. And as everybody knows, once you begin watching a video on YouTube, no matter what, you are locked in. You are absolutely invested and engaged in it despite its content and quality until the end, right? Yeah. Wait. No. Actually, no. That's right. No. Because content matters. What is it that you actually changed up by taking your secret codes off of Facebook and putting them on YouTube? You can add colors, change some of the images we see. You can add spooky audio and sci-fi effects. You can make yourself a lot more mysterious and visually interesting. You can dress up everything around your content, make it pop a bit more. But if the content itself is still a vague message and a secret code, how enticed am I to go through the effort of solving it? And how likely am I to do that if, as a fan of web series, ARGs, and all manner of things like it, I see this stuff all the time in the middle of actually developed series I have mental and emotional stake in? Not very likely. There is exactly one way this old approach ever manages to work for luring in audiences. Showing us something new and promising with it. If this is your hook, it better have a hell of a lot of bait on it. Because as a fish, I'm going to see the metal and the plastic line that's been tied to that suspicious free meal. Make me want to be stupid and take the bait when I can plainly see your intention. Mysterious, audience luring behavior is like the punchline to a joke. It almost never has an effect on its own. Very good punchlines can still get you or entice you to find out what the setup was, but it's not often that happens. People need footholds to get them in the door for an experience. It's why we have movie trailers. There needs to be an emotionally and mentally engaging lure beyond, ooh, that's creepy and or mysterious. We need something to get us invested. Despite what you may believe, secret codes are not the setup. They are the punchline. We actually get context and a measure of understanding a situation with some hint of a reward to come with the setup to a joke. In a secret code, we have no idea if there's even something worth the effort on the other side of the door. We could end up solving the code and getting just another vague, boring, mysterious message, which, by the way, happens 80% of the time with web series and ARGs. The audience is way too used to opening the door to find nothing but the same atmosphere behind it. Usually, being new and different from the attempts at something we've seen before will be enough. That's why the web series 2H32 is working so well. It's doing something that is, from its premise, quite similar to a lot of stuff you can easily dismiss. But within the first video, you know it's a new animal. Furthermore, secret codes have a huge issue that people seem to miss all the time, and it's one we just talked about. You need to tell me why the choice you made was necessary and makes sense. And you must be completely convincing. Way, way too often. There is no justifiable writing reason for using secret codes, especially ones that can be solved immediately through online deciphering tools. A secret code is not so secret when everybody can recognize Base32, copy and paste your message, click a button, and get the answer. There is usually one reason and one reason alone that people do this. They think the audience enjoys it. They think it will bring people in and make them feel rewarded. No, it's less thrilling than opening a fortune cookie. At least a fortune cookie is something you have emotional stake in because it's going to tell you about your life, and you actually came in caring about your life. When Marble Hornets used secret codes, it was exciting, and when Everyman Hybrid and Tribe 12 did this after, we stuck with it for a while. Then everybody started to do this, and most of the time, there was no justification for it in the writing. To be quite honest, I even have a hard time now defending the use of it by To The Ark and Marble Hornets. The Observer in Tribe 12 legitimately has more of a story reason for doing so, because he's torturing Noah with tedious work on purpose. To be antagonizing is his entire motivation as a character. But when To The Ark did it, the technique was very new and different, and if we stretch a little, we can use a bit of character motivation reasoning for it. But overall, its moment of being shiny and new was what made it work. Now, it's overused and brought in for all the wrong moments and reasons. If your character is using secret codes, and your justification for it is luring people in, your character is fishing with bad bait, where they might as well be casting a line in the fountain at your local park. There aren't many practices I'm going to adamantly shake my head at, but the upfront use of easily broken secret codes is one that I've really been waiting to address. Is there a time and a place for codes? 
Yes, absolutely 100% there is a place and a time for codes. And there is a web series where I've seen it done very, very well. We'll be addressing specific techniques like using codes much later though. For now, I just needed to express that, like the punchline to a joke, it is not something you introduce right out of the gate. And now that I have, let's head back to our starting point. You've got an alien. They're online and they're trying to lure people in for a nefarious purpose. Secret codes are out the window when it comes to bait and just like that, we have no immediate reason to use YouTube. Because even in a video, codes without emotional and mental stakes set up for them don't lure people in. What we're left with is an alien who's on the internet looking for a hunting ground where lots of people are. They've got to learn human beings using a method they think is going to work, but isn't necessarily that great because remember, it's an alien. It doesn't totally understand how people operate. Think like an alien, but also like a person who knows aliens aren't fully educated enough to pull this off without catching a real sucker. Let's go back to the drawing board as the alien and see where most human connection activity lies. Immediately, you'll focus on Facebook, and all of your study of human activity online will confirm the power of that website. If hunting is your chore, this is where you're going to find the wild game. So, you envision the alien setting up a fake profile, dressing it up real nice and tight, being as convincing as possible while still having a few mistakes here and there, and coming out with... What honestly appears to be one of those fake porn star type profiles that sends friend requests to people out of the blue. The alien will think it's perfect. You will think it's painfully stupid. But you haven't used your night mind yet to take a look at the situation as it unfolds. The alien sends out friend requests in the area where it can proceed to study new friends. Most are rejected, some ignored, and a few accepted. Messages are sent out, seeking contact using basic human greetings expected from an attractive female of the species. So far, it looks exactly like spam. We now float to the other side of the computer screen where one of the recipients is reading the message. He checks the profile, sees that she is obviously some sort of information phishing scam or equally malicious thing, and leans back, arms folded. He's had these scam artists in his inboxes all of his life, and he has never interacted, always just deleted the messages. What if he has a little bit of fun with this one before he gets rid of them? See what makes a scam artist bastard like this tick. Make them play the fool for once. So he fires off a playful message and gets a conversation started. Moments later, a reply arrives, and it's not quick to the point on the scam. The hack is actually trying to fake a conversation. <laughs> the guy can't believe it, so he shakes his head, smiles a little, and replies back. Ten minutes in, he is convinced of at least one thing. Whoever he's talking to did not learn English as their first language. They type very formally and their sentence structure is a little bit odd. It's a bit robotic, but he is intrigued. There's no request yet for a credit card, help to get them to the United States, anything like that. What gives? What is it you want? He finally asks the odd woman. Communication, she says. I wish to learn about you. Why? You don't know me. Not yet. Is that not the point? But why? You intrigue me. The man is confused, but slightly entertained. He says goodbye to the intrigued woman and logs off. Over the course of the next few days, he holds an ongoing conversation with her, and still... No spam or requests for personal or financial information. She's not looking for a home, she's just interested in him. And maybe, just maybe, she's legitimate? The man decides that he needs a couple of eyes to look this over and see if there's anything he's missing in the situation. He turns to the one place that he can always trust, Reddit. He pulls up the Let's Not Meet subreddit and opens a thread about a situation, writing up a summary of the story so far and posting screen cams of the dialogue with the mysterious woman. The Redditors of Let's Not Meet are intrigued. Most think that this is definitely something bad, while others joke about sending a message to the lady themselves. Honestly, she might enjoy that, our main character writes. Let me ask her if she wants to make some new friends. He sends a quick message. The reply comes within two minutes. Yes, new friends of yours would be amazing. Do not use the Facebook, though. Please, do send emails. She then provides an email address for the Redditors to send correspondence. And sure enough, some brave souls do. Replies come back to all within a few hours, full of the same strange, formal, not quite right manner of speaking. All messages want to know the same thing. Can you answer some questions for me, please? Those who respond positively receive a PDF file they can edit asking all sorts of information, but nothing too invasive. First names, no last names, sex, age, orientation, appearance, all sorts of information, but nothing that could necessarily be used to track a person down. A few send messages with completed forms. I'll receive replies back, but some of the readers from Let's Not Meet are... Rejected. I apologize, but I must not continue conversation for you. I thank you for speaking with me, all the rejection notices say. The others receive information to send friend requests to specific women on Facebook, all of whom appear to be more accounts that look fake. But for those who follow through, the women are real. 
or at least whoever's typing from behind them are, and they all talk in the same robotic, formal, not quite native manner. Something weird is definitely going on here. If this is a scam, its purpose is entirely unclear. The chosen Facebook friends decide to open their own subreddit, Circle of Nine, for those who follow through on the weird experiment. They report all their findings with each other, operating a full-blown investigation into what's going on. Any dialogue with the Facebook women is shared. Something really is happening, but nobody can figure out what. Five days after the subreddit opens, all nine members receive the same email at the same time from the same website. We, your friends, are all together now. We invite you to join us at this location and this time. Our learning has only just begun. Do you wish to learn from each other? The website is extremely simple. Black background, white text, barely formatted. A set of coordinates has been written with a date and time. The coordinates point to the middle of the woods in a highly forested area just outside a small town in Wisconsin. At least four members of the Circle of Nine are close enough to make it there. Two of the four closest members decide to go. They promise the others they'll be updating the entire way and recording whatever happens. One of them, the closest to the area, heads out first to scout the location and let the other on his way know if there's anything to be seen yet. The mystery is about to be blown wide open. Or so they hope. The seven members of the Circle of Nine who stayed home watch updates come in from the first guy to enter the woods. He keeps them updated for a bit, saying there's nothing interesting yet. His final update post comes 18 minutes before the meeting time posted on the site. Those online flood him with messages, but no replies are sent. The second man has arrived five minutes before the appointed meeting time. His friends online urge him not to go in, but with one of their own out there and unresponsive, he feels compelled to head inside. If that guy is in danger, then he needs help. They're all in this together, like it or not. Leave no man behind. He heads into the woods, a flashlight guiding his way, until at last arriving at the precise coordinates point. He's recording his entire journey, broadcast live to Twitter through Periscope. There's nothing to be found, except a camera lying among the leaves in a small clearing. He picks it up, examines it, sees the dirt from the impact that came when it was dropped, and knows it's time to go. The man sprints from the woods with the camera he recovered, still broadcasting to indicate that he's alive and on his way out. He slows down when the headlights of his truck finally come into view in the distance. His friends cheer him on, a hero among men. That's when we hear a muffled scream and the phone goes flying out of his hand. The broadcast ends after two minutes of darkness that are filled with the noises of struggle, screaming, and machine sounds. None of the viewers end up getting much sleep that night. One in particular, the man who is the third closest to the coordinates, doesn't sleep at all. He decides to map out the length of travel to the site of the incident online and plans his projected time of arrival with the full break of dawn. He keeps a close eye on his phone, continuously checking the time, and then leaves on the mark with his camera in tow, as well as a couple of weapons. He needs to go to the scene. This was his fault. He was the man who posted about the woman from Facebook on the Let's Not Meet subreddit. Two innocent guys might be dead because he wanted to see how far an experiment could go. When he reaches the site, he sees the second man's truck from the Twitter broadcast sitting exactly where he left it. The headlights are off now, his battery drained. Just about 50 yards into the woods, the man's cell phone can be found, smashed beyond any repair, and lying next to the first investigator's camera. Our third man, the original poster, takes the camera and phone, heads back to his vehicle, and goes home. He's not exactly great at video software, but he knows enough to compile screenshots and text that summarize the entire story, from the first message on Facebook to this very morning. He uploads it to YouTube, and after talking to the rest of the Circle of Nine, holds off on uploading the footage from the camera. But one by one, members of the Circle stop showing up on the subreddit. Any attempt to contact them is met with silence. Those who remain begin to panic, especially because all the accounts of the women online disappeared the morning after the meeting in the woods, so there's no one they can gain answers from. Emails that are sent to the website address are met with the same response. We unfortunately missed you at our scheduled gathering. Thankfully, we may come to you. We shall see you soon. Once the circle of nine dwindles down to three, the original poster uploads an update informing us of the situation. He also uploads the footage of the camera, which contains exactly the kind of video you expect. Man walks into the woods at night. Man looks around nervously. Man gets violently abducted by aliens. How much of the aliens we see depends on your ability to show them. If you could, great. If not, so be it. As long as it was scary, it would work. The video would end with a message from the uploader. He and the other survivors agreed to share this in a bid to gain help. They need to widen their circle to get to the bottom of this, and maybe, maybe, be the ones that got away. They, of course, have no idea that it's aliens they're dealing with. It could be anything out there that got their friends, but it sure isn't human. Any help they can get would be appreciated, if only to be sure they no longer feel like they're alone. And that's where we come in for the grand adventure. 
or the grander adventure you might say depending on what you plan to do. At this point in our hypothetical project, if you were the creator, then you would have a YouTube channel with a major hook, backstory on events, and the perfect foundation of role-playing atmosphere, uploader motivation, and logical sense for existing. A subreddit in which only three of the original accounts that are part of the story technically need to be active, which you as a single person could totally pull off by switching between them. An extremely haunting Facebook presence whenever you want to use it and scare the hell out of someone or engage them further. A very, very simple website you can manipulate however you need to, along with an associated email account that can be used to correspond with people and personal Twitter accounts from the abducted members of the Circle of Nine. Boom. YouTube, Reddit, Facebook, email, personal site, and Twitter if you wanted it. You now have the ability to run this story and engagement across at least six outlets just to start. By having the subreddit you created and maintained be such an integral part of the story that anybody can visit, you've established a gathering place for all players in your game. With the email account provided for the Aliens website, players could contact the enemy and receive information directly without you explicitly reaching out to them as one of the aliens. If you needed video elements or a more personal lifeline to your main character, YouTube is there. And so on and so forth as you get people in, open the gates, and design the big, elaborate electronic maze you want them to run around in. Now in this concept, we do have choices. We could go totally for broke by organically designing and playing out every stage of that backstory publicly, which would be an amazing feat that makes the Circle of Nine bigger than it was at the start. Or you could fake as much of it as possible to get the screenshots and authenticity for the videos, launch the videos, and let the audience jump on at that point. You'd have to do a lot of puppeteering on a public forum, playing different roles with yourself using multiple accounts, and you might end up dealing with players as one of the fake Facebook women, but you could pull it off. Your only real issue would be that someone in Wisconsin would probably be brave enough to go to that site, and if you had an audience of players this early, you would need to go out into the woods at night nearby where you live and fake the whole Periscope broadcast on Twitter. You'd have to do quite a bit of faking things, actually. But it would be extremely exciting for early players in the game, and you'd have a ton of fun with it too. What happens after the video you post opening that subreddit to YouTube would be entirely in your hands. You wanted a platform so twisted aliens could intersect with human victims. And now, you've got it. Play things have been ordered and delivered. And the best part is, none of them are even aware that your villains are aliens. You could make that the central mystery, doling out small pieces of information every so often to have players put it all together. Now, do I want you to actually go and make this idea? No, of course not. This is an original web series concept I just came up with and sacrificed in the same breath for an example. Could have been cool and fun if it happened, but if somebody made it now, we'd all be in on the whole thing and could never truly enjoy it. What you can do is examine everything we can take away from the hypothetical for your education on Red Path ideas. Every choice that was made regarding platforms and media outlets had solid reasoning why. From the alien choosing Facebook as its hunting ground to our character posting on the Let's Not Meet subreddit for help, you can see the logic behind every decision made. Because character A wanted to do something, they initiated event A and involved character B. Due to being involved with event A, character B gained a motivation of their own and initiated event B. And the chain continues. Because of motivation, something happens, which creates new motivations in characters, who then take actions of their own that make logical sense according to their reasoning, and we understand their behavior as viewers. A bunch of visitors on Let's Not Meet experience the same thing from an experiment, so they open their own subreddit to hold an investigation as a group. You needed a gathering place for the audience of your project, but it had to exist for a really good reason, and its origin couldn't be forced. This is your perfect answer to the problem. It's the same thing with the Wyoming incident, which you might have noticed is what the title of my example is referencing. That's another lesson for you from my video on the Yellow Path about using inspiration over imitation. It's the same thing the Wyoming incident did, but we did something different. It's not a forum hidden away somewhere for wannabe serial killers that end up as a gathering place for players. It's a new subreddit with an origin point you can trace for victims of alien catfishing that ends up as a gathering place for players. Same thing, but different. Inspiration over imitation. So, we made constant choices that had reasoning behind them we could explain and defend with conviction, and we set up a hub of activity and gathering for our players that makes sense. What else did we accomplish? Through the email address, the website, Facebook, and even the Circle of Nine subreddit itself, we have access points to engage players as the villain characters and hero characters. You could even use the Twitter accounts of the missing members of the original Circle to mess with people if you wanted. Maybe that could be a major plot point. Members who were abducted suddenly returning, but not quite being themselves anymore. We also have audience magnet points in the form of YouTube, the original Let's Not Meet post, the subreddit, and whatever websites or, say, YouTube channels mention this crazy alternate reality game going on about Facebook spam accounts turning evil. It could even end up on other subreddits and might be talked about on 4chan's X-Board, where a few weird events like the live broadcast of the Force meeting have been discussed. 
They kind of hate ARGs, web series, and anything popular over there, but they do appreciate a good story if you can sell it to them. Finally, I think we did a pretty decent job of telling a story that can say a good deal about people and things we encounter in a modern world. From the way we interact with people online and the ability of strangers to come together against evil, there's a bit of art already visible. I'm sure more would have come of it had the project been a genuine thing. Now, let's move to the other side of the Red Path ideas. Abstract art over gameplay and engagement. With this example, I'm not going to be as technical and, I suppose, methodical as the previous. There's an idea I'm seeing for this example that I can't shake off. I don't have all the answers yet about what I'm getting, but I sense that we're going to discover them together as I walk you through. Makes sense considering we're now visiting the more abstract, art-focused side of Red Path. I'm seeing a dusty old room. Looks like it belongs to a house that's at least as old as the 1960s. Nobody has lived here for quite some time. We're looking through a camera, focused on a rough-looking Barbie doll. It reminds me of Angelica's toy Cynthia from the Nickelodeon show Rugrats, about waist-high shot taking in the torso and head, wearing an old, tattered, and yellowed wedding dress. Nothing too lacy or expensive, just something cheap that would have come with the doll. She's also decorated with pieces of other doll garments and plastic jewelry, as if somebody took a look at just the dress and knew it wasn't enough, so they grabbed whatever they could to brighten it up. There's a music box playing from somewhere in the room. We follow the doll as it moves around. We can tell somebody is moving her across the floor by holding her legs, but their hand is just below the frame, ensuring the camera doesn't see them. This is not a new camera. More 1990s than modern. She approaches a male doll. Not a Ken doll, but some sort of competitor. The paint for his brown hair has been rubbed away, and his nose has been roughed up. He was handsome, but rough treatment and time has taken away as much attractive appearance from him as his bride. He wears the outfit of a prince, like he came from a Cinderella toy set. It's in as good a shape as the Barbie's wedding dress. There's no priest here, just a really sad-looking beanie baby that you know has open seams on it somewhere. Bands of sunlight spill across the back wall. Dust mites float around, caught by the sun rays. You can sense how empty and uncomfortable this place is. The house this room belongs to gives you the impression of being alone. You are alone, but at the same time, you aren't. Something is in here with you. It might not be physical, it's certainly not welcoming. The camera takes close-up shots of Barbie, then the bear, and then the prince. The prince's shots are blurry and his face is dark. The light is at his back, while the shots of Barbie are focused and illuminated by the sunlight. The bear is casting a sideways shadow, most of him in the sun. After what I assume are the first few speech portions of a priest performing wedding rites, we get a shot of the prince doll that sees the shadow of an arm pass over him. A large sewing needle comes down and pierces the top of his head. It takes whoever's using it a moment to break through the plastic, but they do manage to get through and sink the needle down deep. In the next shot, the prince doll is laying face down where he stood. Someone has spilled red liquid on the bare old wooden floor beneath him, simulating blood. The music box has been playing this whole time, and as we move to a close-up on Barbie's face, it finally reaches its ending notes. I then see the Barbie doll standing up in a corner of the room. The camera is high up, actually being held by whoever's recording, and they're pointing it down to capture her image. She's not facing into the corner, she's facing the open room, but she's very much isolated. A cassette player sits nearby, playing some 80s pop tune over a tape. We can see the shadow of the person recording running diagonal across the frame from the bottom to the left. It's not defined enough for us to know anything about them. The screen cuts to black for about 7 seconds, then we open to a new shot, another close-up of Barbie. It catches mostly her head and neck, and then a good amount of her torso as well, then repeats that order over and over, because she's swinging back and forth in view of the camera. Someone has taken sewing thread to make a noose, secured on the neck just under her head. The cameraman, or woman, or whoever, is holding the end of the noose's rope just above the frame, swinging Barbie gently back and forth in view. She is not wearing her wedding dress anymore. And that's it. The video ends. I see the screen turn slightly gray and YouTube's autoplay feature icon appears, counting down to another video on the channel. More dolls, now with painted wooden blocks in view. There's a whole collection of videos just like this. All of these little scenarios played out in this room with beaten up old toys. The title of this video is Promises, keeping in line with other titles across the channel, like Wishes, Older, Job, and Friends. The video description consists of two words, age 9, and we see a similar setup across the other videos, listing ages that range from 1 year to 16. Video tags repeat the ages from descriptions and also add in dates. I'm seeing 4, 17, 1978 on the first video, Promises. Many of these are from the 1970s for their video tag dates, a few from the 80s, and a lot from the 90s. 
Many of the more decorated pieces that have a lot of toys come from the later 80s and throughout the 90s. This is like the Jack Torrance channel, but with toys playing out events, and each video is its own short story. Every upload is shot in the same white walled room with bare wooden floors, using the same camera, recorded by the same person, setting up the same toys in different places and combinations. Some scenery is more elaborate, introducing blankets and painted cardboard. Sometimes there are small signs made from paper and crayon, or markers, but only to add to the setting or serve the events on camera. Nothing that's telling us directly what we're meant to take away from the video. The name of the channel is Kiddo20-2. Immediately you could make the connection between the channel's name and the span of dates. All videos are contained within a timeline of 20 years, from 1978 to 1998. The slash 2 figure is odd, but that's a mystery that would unravel for viewers of the channel as things developed. The style of the videos changes with the decade listed in the tags. It's not always a plain recording with music in the room. As it gets closer to the 90s, things become flashier, brighter, and we even get effects and video inserts that could only be achieved in post-production with editing. Videos from the 90s are full of these big, colorful pieces. Over the course of the uploads, the profile and banner images evolve, reflecting the shifting of style from decade to decade. You can tell that this is either a toy company, or a children's entertainment corporation, or possibly both. It doesn't exist, obviously, but the entire channel's appearance is being dressed up like an official business account. Maybe there's an associated website in the About section. I think it could work, but if there was, it would lead to a page from one of those make-your-own-website places. Something to keep up the act while letting people know it's not real. This is a weird one. Definitely something I would get emails and messages on Tumblr about if it was real. My immediate impression is that this thing is a very cynical project, but it's not just making statements out of thin air. Someone is putting this all together in the context of the channel. It's not just a creator like you or me uploading their project right to YouTube. Somebody in this fictional world, as part of the Kiddo 20-2 story, is making and uploading these, and they're not simply drawing inspiration from their own dark viewpoints. The sense I got from receiving this idea as I began writing it was like communicating with a ghost. It felt like channeling. My impression is that it's not just the way that I'm getting this vision, it's also part of the story. Channeling something is in the concept. Whoever is making these videos is trying to relate the feelings and stories of someone who has died, but left some kind of residual record or very well may be haunting this place. Perhaps it's more than one force at work. But we do have a medium, somebody acting as a translator, who takes the dolls and toys and creates these videos to deliver a cynical, but history-based take on concepts taught to a person who lived sometime between 1978 and 1998. It's an art statement, very much a project from the abstract art side of the Red Path. While viewer engagement is mainly on YouTube, it still requires a lot of piecing together by viewers to be understood. It's not linear storytelling, nor is it very easily accessible to people, but it's absolutely nailing what it needs to do. And while YouTube as an outlet seems odd, there is a definite reason for it, even if it would take the audience a while to understand that the uploader is a character with motivations for using the platform and making these videos. I can tell you that it's not always necessary to have yourself covered on who uploaded this and why for your idea. Yes, this is one of those rare events I mentioned earlier where you don't completely need to have this answer. Sometimes, we're just not going to get lucky enough to find a story or world-build-based reason to explain. An idea can be so powerful on its own at times, and the content and everything in it so good and thoroughly backed by writing, that at the end, you've just got to shrug and say, You know what? I can't handle the immersion aspect of the platform I'm using and my upload method. It's not possible without me forcing it. And that's quite alright. You don't have to go all in by actively spreading around word of your project as fiction or an online art installation. Merely let it be, have it exist as itself, and viewers can speculate. Maybe they'll fill in the blank with something genius that you didn't find as the connection and it can be adopted as canon. Quite often, Red Path artwork is begun by a creator, but added to by the audience. What matters is the service to your idea and how well you execute what it's calling on you to do. Feelings provide instruction, and intuition acts as a guide. As long as you can stand back, observe the creation along its building session every once in a while and say, yes, this makes sense in its own context and in the context of the whole story, then you're good. The language of symbols, metaphors, visuals, and audio are quite open to interpretation. Only you will know for certain if it matches your emotional and mental understanding of something while also being accessible enough to reach most people. There can be cultural barriers, language barriers, even age barriers, and just pure inabilities to comprehend what you're saying with visual means. But if it works for the concept and you know it, go ahead. I think that about wraps up our introductory exploration of the Red Path. As you might be thinking right now, there are specific and even really technical things to cover in this area that we haven't gone over, but that's why this is only phase one of the Red Path course. Got to know the layout of our building before we assume responsibilities and get to work. This is only our first day on the job. 
I'll be going through the comments section to find any questions you may have about our field. Please do ask away if anything's on your mind, and I'll be happy to answer if I'm able in a comprehensive video. As previously mentioned, I'm proud to announce that I have an official subreddit dedicated to the Nightmind channel and discussion of everything on it, related matters, and of course, the topics being covered in this course. Go to r slash nightmind and talk about your ideas, issues you're having, thoughts that cross your mind, and your progress with other viewers who are taking the journey to become creators. I'm even an official mod, so I'll check in to see how things are going and help out. And if you're somebody who enjoys Discord servers, the r slash nightmind community has one, so you can interact in live time. These communities are official. Consider them the public meeting grounds for Nightmind enthusiasts. If help is needed for any branch of your journey, you're likely to find it here. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and I'll be seeing you again real soon. Enjoy developing your ideas and discussing studies with your fellow students. Class dismissed.